This is Fantology. You may have heard of us. All right, what's up, fantasy book fans? This is Stephen, your host from Fantology Podcast, along with my lifelong friend Ben. And today we have an extra special guest. We have Shauna Lawless, author of The Children of Gods and Fighting Men, due out in about three weeks at recording time. I, I think that's right, Shauna, right at the beginning of September. And uh, the first of September, um, everywhere apart from America. And in America, oh, it's, the right. first of, it's the first of September for the ebook. Um, but the hardback is available on the first of November. Okay, so us Americans have to wait a little bit longer for the the actual hard copy, but uh, you can get the ebook and then audiobook. Are we thinking same time? Yes, it's September some stage. It was meant to be the first of September, um, but there's a little bit of a delay. Um, but hopefully, only a few weeks. And we were lucky lucky enough to get an advanced copy, and uh, I've I've finished the book as of. Yesterday is excited to kind of get through the the last few pages, and I quite enjoyed it. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this one. Oh, great! <laughs> yeah, and I am about two thirds of the way through, so um, I am planning on so finishing it this week. Yeah, shame, shame on me. Shame on <laughs> but th that ensures our audience that there will be no spoilers. So because I will be upset if there's spoilers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, for sure. This is not designed to be an overview of the plot, or, or really, you know, too much of a of a detailed review at all i think we mostly just want to talk to you shauna about uh how what, what your process in writing is and and just kind of give people a general idea of what to expect okay yep that's perfect okay so that said tell uh the listeners what they can expect uh what what is unique about your book what uh there's a lot of kind of cool settings and and characters and such so uh yeah tell us about it Okay, so it's a historical fantasy. So it has um, a 10th century Ireland setting um, and a lot of historical characters are in my book. But there are also um, characters in my book who are from two magical tribes um, and their magical powers are derived from Irish mythology. And they are also interacting with the various historical characters um, in the story. So 10th century <laughs> Ireland, this is like, it's, it's like late 1900s AD, which- 900s, 900s. Yeah, sorry, 900s, not, yeah, not 1900s, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so this must be, I, this is not a, this is not a usual setting. It's a time period that I personally don't know much about. So I think that's one thing we're really interested in, in hearing about, like, uh, this must be a, a passion project for you, right? You're kind of a historical student and a big fan of this time period, obviously from Ireland. So, um, what was the like? It, what was the um, inspiration, or, or why did you decide to set a book at this time? Well, I think um, if I look at Irish history and mythology, it's inspired a lot of great stories. Um, especially in fantasy, you know, I, I can see Irish mythology in Tolkien, um, in, uh, you know, like Robert Jordan's books, uh, John Gwynne's books, you know, I can see Irish mythology mm -hmm. there. And I sort of thought it was time to use Irish history and mythology as the actual setting, as opposed to just the inspiration. Um, I think in a lot of fantasy books, um, you get med medieval Britain as the sort of setting shall yeah. we say um mm -hmm. certainly medieval europe um but ireland at this time was very different to the rest of europe it's quite distinct in its culture um christianity has come over people have converted but not very well um the pagan belief system is still very strong at this time and so for me it was quite exciting to use ireland as a backdrop because i know mm -hmm. people don't know it very well mm -hmm. and so it was something sort of similar like it's not too different but it's also new and it's the new stuff that I find quite <coughs> interesting and then in terms of the Irish mythology um, I think a lot of people know Irish folklore which would be like leprechauns and fairies yeah. and Darby mm -hmm. O'Gill and the little mm -hmm. people um, but that isn't Irish mythology Irish mythology is older than that and so I also I love that I love that for 
ever since I can remember. So for me, combining the two offered something kind of maybe a bit unique, but mm. something that I'm excited mm. about, you know, and I think when you write, you need to write for yourself first. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could ever really write to markets or to what is, you know, in right now. I think you would never enjoy that process. So that was definitely why I chose the Irish setting and the Irish mythology as the backdrop. Hmm. Yeah, that's really good to hear. I mean, like, because I know that you kind of run a blog where you talk about like a lot of Irish mythology as well, right? So like, yeah. um, is this something that you knew kind of had like an audience going into it? Or is it just something like, I'm interested in it, so I'm going to assume that other people will be as well? Well, Irish mythology, lots of people in Ireland are really into it. Um, uh -huh. They really enjoy it. Mm. I obviously outside Ireland, not so much. Um, yeah. But I think the people who do like it really like it. And yeah. who, if there is that passion there, I think, you know, more people could really enjoy Irish mythology if they just had the chance um, to read it and to access it. Um, I think in terms of accessibility, Irish mythology is a little bit harder than Greek. Mm. Yeah. Or, or Norse. Um, I think, you know, it's not like there's just one book that you can read. Um, there's lots of stories. Some stories are the same story, but told differently, depending on what uh, documents you're reading. Um, so I knew all that, you know, I've been reading Irish mythology for years. So I'm trying to, in my blog, at least to make it a bit more accessible and understandable yeah. for people who aren't from Ireland or don't know anything about it. That's cool. Hmm. So from a historical perspective, this is a really interesting time for Ireland because it's this intermingling of the Vikings that are coming over um, with, the, with the traditional Irish people. So tell us a little bit more about, um, maybe just about that time period and why it was so important for Ireland. Okay, so Ireland has never really been invaded. Um, recently. So in England, you have had the Romans have come over mm. and then they have left. Ireland, the Romans never came. So mm. the Vikings were the first um, invaders that Ireland had had for, for quite a period of time. Um, but Ireland is very much a war tribal society. So when the Vikings come, the Vikings initially don't get any land. It's not like in England and Scotland where they are taking over quite big portions um, of the country. Mm. But in Ireland, um, they give the Vikings ports. So mm. it's very small pieces of land. But in these ports, the Vikings who stay build up these massive markets. Um, they're trading everything. And they're trading goods down from Norway into Europe and goods from Europe up into England and Ireland and into Norway. So suddenly the port of Dublin and also Waterford and Wexford to a lesser extent become these huge economic hubs and suddenly Ireland has a lot of money or there's a lot of wealth that is coming into the mm. into the country and so rather than the Irish fighting off the Vikings the way um, it happens in England they are more trying to marry their children into the Viking families mm. and so what you get in Dublin at the time of my book is that a lot of the Vikings who live in Dublin are actually now also Irish. They have, they're like from mixed marriages. And so you have almost like a new culture is emerging. Um, and I find that very interesting. And then also because of the wealth um, of these ports, they all are in the south of Ireland. And traditionally, all the power in Ireland had been in the north. So suddenly, mm. The, the power of balance, sorry, the balance of power in Ireland starts to shift. The, the, the kind of power base in the north starts to crumble and the kings in the south are starting to become more, more um, powerful. And so that's why there's such a time of upheaval and it's such an interesting time to, to study. That's really cool because you kind of see that in the book, but it's from like a very character centric perspective, right? Like, so... Yeah. Um, you kind of get a sense that there's like these tectonic shifts happening, but you're also just like seeing it from these, you know, two main point, like viewpoint characters. So it's, it's cool to hear you talk about like this grand, like sweeping changes from like a historical perspective. And then mm -hmm. to think about from the perspective of the characters. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the character, well, the two uh, POV characters I have, 
probably aren't so attuned to the economic shift in mm. Ireland, but they sure. feel the shift um, yeah. because they are seeing that the wars um, in Ireland are increasing um, and Ireland feels a bit more chaotic and they are then trying to survive in this Ireland that is dangerous. Mm. Whilst also, you know, trying to, to succeed and to do what they want to do. Yeah. And one of the things that they notice a lot is the, the religious shifting as well. That's happening at the time, right? Yes. So, um, well, it's not really a spoiler, but there is one scene um, in my story where in, in Dublin, in Dublin, they can't decide what burial to give mm -hmm. someone. Um, and that was, I did that specifically because I wanted to really ground the reader in that this isn't a heavily converted country. Mm -hmm. um, and I know a lot of people think Ireland is this very Catholic country now. And I think it surprises people when I say, but in the 10th and 11th century, Ireland was actually like, it was not very Christian in terms of belief systems. Um, Rome certainly saw Ireland as in need of massive reform at this time. Um, there was huge issues. They weren't really following any of the doctrine. Um, and so I sort of find that interesting to think, well, if you're living in Ireland at this time, you've sort of converted, but you have all these pagan beliefs. What actually are you doing? You know, what yeah. do you really believe in? What are you like? How would you bury, bury someone? Um, and I wanted to ground the reader in that, that the religious conflict isn't the issue here. That's all kind of up in the air and people are going with the flow a little bit. Yeah, um, mm. yeah it's not like the last kingdom where um, kind of the English and the Vikings are fighting and it's very much a religious yeah. issue. Um, that's not the case in Ireland. So I wanted mm. that's that's the difference that I want to kind of let the reader know quite quickly. The sense that I got was that like everybody just kind of like has a pragmatic belief where it's like what's going to benefit them the best in like in that uh, given situation. So um, I could kind of see that where it's just kind of like everybody's just kind of it's a like a, a amalgamation of like a bunch of different um, beliefs to kind of like serve individuals at the time. Exactly. Yes, because we know um, certainly initially when the Vikings began to convert, it was really um, so they could trade with the Christian countries at the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't always necessarily that they believed it. So you have to feed that into it as well. Um, yeah. You know, when people convert, it's not always, um, you know, kind of a religious awakening. Sometimes it is for pragmatic reasons. <laughs> yeah. So that's all the actual history, but this is a historical fantasy. Yeah. So <laughs> to what extent uh, do you follow the history? What, uh, what kind of changes did you have to make? So I think I follow the history pretty accurately. Um, I haven't deviated too much. Um, there's some name changes I had to make because there were a lot of Olafs. Um, <laughs> and I didn't want there to be three in one story. That would be confusing. Um, <laughs> and then I tightened the timeline ever so slightly. So there wasn't um, as big a time gaps um, between the events. But that is it. So in terms of the fantasy, it was really that on top of all the wars I'm talking about that are historical, there is a much older war going on behind the scenes, mm. um, which is from mythology, where there are descendants of the Tuatadanan, who um, kind of used to be the kings of Ireland. And the Fomorians is another magical tribe who also um, had, a king, had kings of Ireland. And they mm. didn't like each other. They fought in our mythologies. And so we're kind of, I wanted to bring that like feud into the story as well. Yeah. So if, if I were to Google like these characters' names in like history, would I like see spoilers for the book? Yeah. Okay. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's really what I was wondering. I'm like, dang, I really like, I'm interested in the history now, but I don't want to look it up because I don't want to, you know, see like who wins or whatever. So, um, okay. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> And so this is a this is a planned trilogy, correct? Yes. Um, first book is obviously out. Um, I've read through it, uh, so I'm I'm guessing that, and maybe tell me if this is not accurate, but you you probably have like a set window of historical events that you want to cover, and so we're just kind of through the opening act here in the first book. Yes. So um, yeah, that's true. There is like I don't want to 
tell you and spoil it, but there is a big, big battle on the horizon. Um, that would be a fairly well-known battle in Ireland um, mm. that I am leading up to. And that's okay. where the third work will get to. One thing I think is interesting with the battles, which uh, I think lends a lot of historical accuracy, I, I assume, is that uh, they're big battles, but it's like they have a couple thousand guys mm, fighting yeah. on each side. And which I imagine was probably true back then, like there weren't nearly as many people in the world. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, exactly. Um, and also, um, it is a, a warrior culture, but you know, it was also, you know, the people are farmers and they look after cattle and their family people. So not everyone is trained to fight. Um, but in previous uh, kind of centuries, probably the battles would have been even smaller. It's the, the introduction of the Vikings and mercenaries who come and fight really then start to, to grow the armies as well. So um, the army that we're, sorry, the battle we're leading up to, you'll see like, it, you know, things start to grow in terms of numbers as well. It is, it is interesting to kind of see that like historical perspective because like so much of the time you're like, oh, this army amassed tens of thousands of people and you're like, okay, I guess I can believe uh -huh. that. But when you're like, okay, this army has 2,500 people and this army only has 2,000 people, like that's kind of, and the, like, so that army has the advantage, you know, that's kind of, it's cool to get that kind of realistic perspective here. Yeah, and I it, know, um, sorry, just one of the edits I had was about the numbers and it was uh, also about the size of Dublin and the editor couldn't believe that Dublin was so small mm, and that the numbers mm. were this size, but Ireland is a small country, you know, yeah. um, it is accurate that, you know, I, I think that these would be the numbers in these situations um, because, um, yeah, like, I mean, how do you feed all these people? Right. Um, yeah. You know, if they're constantly at war the whole time and just, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Yeah. I can't remember which book this was, but recently, I read something where they were fighting and there were like 300,000 people on one side and just like yeah. millions on the other, something like that. So that's kind of the traditional, like crazy epic fantasy battles just with millions on each side. But this is yeah. it's kind of fun. It, it seems like it's more of a, almost more of a personal conflict when uh, you get the viewpoint from the, from the direct ca characters who are in charge, but then they only have like a few hundred on each side at, it, it maybe grounds it in a little more realism, which um, even though there's a lot of magic in your book, it does seem like there's a lot of uh, realistic character things happening too. I like that. Yes, exactly. And then also with the battle scenes, you know, um, there's people there who are observing the battle. Um, and if you had loads and loads of people, then the question would be, well, how can they see um, what's going on? The battlefield would be huge. So yeah. I wanted it to be intimate because obviously you're reading those scenes and it's from two different perspectives. So you know who's on each side and mm -hmm. hopefully you like people on both sides. And so, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, I wanted to ramp up that sort of tension as well. Yeah. Okay. So it's not all fighting. Uh, there is some fighting. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, there's a, there's a smaller percentage of the book that's fighting. It's, it's really, I would say if I had to describe it, I'd say it's more of a character book. So your two main POV characters, um, tell us about them and uh, they, they, well, I'll, I'll let you tell us about them rather than, than, I, than I'll try to explain them. Okay. So my first female character is Gormla. So she's actually a, a historical character as well. Mm -hmm. She did exist um, and history was not kind to her. Um, the, mm. the poets and um bards at the time didn't like her <laughs> very much um really okay because i liked her well um they don't like her because she's a schemer and so mm. she doesn't fit kind of um the expectations of what a queen should be at the time um which you know obviously should be a king okay. should be all the decisions so she she is seen from that lens um so initially when i thought of formula um there's a lot of uh, historical fiction at the minute where perhaps women from the past who have bad reputations are getting their own stories and you're seeing it from their own perspective and they're being drawn in a more sympathetic light but Gormla sort of decided to do the opposite and to make her worse mm. so she mm. is the ultimate schemer 
um, she wants her son to be king and that is her aim and she is adamant that's going to happen. But she is also a Fomorian descendant, so she has fire magic that uh, she has to hide. Um, the descendants of the two Dedanon have basically killed all the Fomorians, apart from a few, and they have stayed hidden to, it, so that they are tricking the two Dedanon into believing that they're all dead. So she has safety as so long as she can conceal that she has this fire magic. So that is also important to her. Um, and then on the other side, we have uh, Thola, who is a descendant of the two of Danon, And she has been probably a little bit unhappy with her life. Um, and she is definitely scared of the, the mortals who live in Ireland. But for, I'm not gonna give away the reason, but she has to start to interact um, with the mortals of Ireland and sort of question her belief system as to why she has always been afraid of them. So is Foda also a historical figure? Is she? Yeah. No. Okay. I, di I didn't think so. Yeah. No, okay. she, she, is, she is fictional, as are all the descendants of the two of Um, The two uh, or three, sorry, from Fomorian characters you meet in the book are all real historical characters. Hmm. And so, so are... and her brother and mother. Are they real in the sense that they were, like, are, are they Fomorian in the legends? Or did you apply the, that kind of secret backstory to them? Yes, I've applied. This is their secret backstory. So in okay. the history that we have, they're just um, normal people uh, or kings or queens or, you know, part of the royal families of various um, uh, royal families within Leinster. Um, but yes, yeah, so this is a secret backstory. And it's sort of a motivation as to why they are scheming so much. That's cool. Okay, so pronounce pronounce the um, the first character's name for me again, because I am going to butcher it. <laughs> Gormla. Gorm okay, Gormla. that that's not how I would have pronounced it. <laughs> but well, uh, everyone with, with... pronounces it Gormfleeth. But that's yeah. why I have the, the pronunciation guide at the start. I, I know, I know, there's a pronunciation <laughs> guide, but yeah. I, I should have paid more attention to that. <laughs> so she reminded me a lot of Cersei Lannister. Did you did you get that vibe? Have you heard that at all? Um, a little bit. I've, I've heard other people say that. Um, except I think, well, I well, I think Cersei Lannister is a great character and she's very complex. But as we get to Feast with Crows and Dance with Dragons, she isn't as clever as she mm. thinks she is. Mm -hmm. I think it would be fair to say, like, she starts to make mistakes, obviously, um, don't want to spoil Game of Thrones for anyone. <laughs> right, right. Um, but um, she does make mistakes. She's not not as clever as she thinks she is. With Gormla, I, I wanted to make her clever. I wanted her to be, you know, she is much smarter than all these men that she's having to contend with. And it's, um, she's sort of having to fight a little bit to have her voice heard. Mm -hmm. Ding. That's interesting. The part of the book I'm at, she uh, is having a hard time with stuff. So yeah, that's, yeah. So that's, uh, that's interesting. Because yeah. another difference with Ireland is that women cannot rule. Um, mm. It's within their law system. So if you go to England at the time um, or after, you know, there are female queens. And so females can have power in their own rights. Mm -hmm. In Ireland, there's, like, there's a subtle difference is that women do not, they never rule. There is never That's any issue with um, men taking over because it's not just the firstborn son that can be the next king. It's a much yeah. wider pool of candidates. So that is why, you know, probably she has to fight a lot harder yeah. to be heard. There's no sort of um, history of women really taking the reins. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that probably explains why she wants her son to be king so much too. Like, yeah, because it's kind of like a proxy for her power. Exactly. Yeah, it's, mm. it it offers freedom for her um, if he is king because yeah. she sort of thinks she'll be left alone to do what she wants. So, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book was um, you did a great job of showing the people on both sides of the conflict and getting me to like them in some ways but dislike them in other ways. And then there's all this anticipation for when different groups meet up 
And then when they do, you're kind of like, oh, which side do I cheer for? And so it just kind of gave me a lot of, a lot of distress as I was trying to decide like, oh, who do I want to come out on top on these conflicts? Because <laughs> I like them in some ways, but I don't like them in other ways. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if that's a, a question as much, but uh, how, how did, how did you, how did you do that? What was your, what was your thought process in trying to uh, make me specifically really uh, kind of connect to both sides of the story? I sort of think you have to, you know, I personally don't like stories over much where there's like the bad guy and there's a good guy. And I, I don't actually overly like leading respect like the POV chapters from someone I really don't like um because I don't I don't find it interesting to read um kind of what's happening to them because I don't like them um so for me it was it's like yeah it's a fine balancing act um they're living in hard times brittle times Gormla especially makes bad or not bad decisions horrible decisions um for other Mm -hmm. people um but I didn't want you to hate her either. I wanted you to kind of feel sympathy for her. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. then on the other side, you have Fula, who's a much gentler character, um, someone that's really quite selfless and, you know, really wants to protect her family, but um, can be passive at times. And other people within the descendant uh, group, not all of them are nice either. Um, and I don't know, that's the sort of story I enjoy. Um, I would definitely say Game of Thrones is a is definitely something that I have been inspired by. Um, and I think that's one of the things I love about that show is, you know, you love the Starks and you hate the Lannisters, but then you sort of like the Lannisters. And then you yeah. have those things uh-huh. where characters that you know hate each other, but you both like um, could potentially meet. And for me, that's where like a huge amount of tension can come from. Well, one of the reasons I love your book is uh, like, I haven't read Game of Thrones, I've watched the movie, but like you definitely have like a redempt- a redemption arc for a couple of the characters. Whereas your book, there's not like a, it's not a redemption arc because there's not like a single event that like makes you dislike a character. It's like, they're, they're just like different shades of gray the whole time, but they're not trying to redeem themselves. And they're not trying to like, like you're not actively trying to like, have them do things that cause you to dislike them either. So anyway, that's just kind of like an observation. I think that yours is a little bit more realistic than having like, you know, a super like terrible, somebody do something super terrible and then like spend the rest of the series trying to like make you like them again. Yeah, no, no, that I haven't done, they haven't done anything, I suppose, well, they've done some bad things, but nothing too awful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they're, they're acting within the society that they... Um, are in you know yeah. the men are pretty terrible too and sometimes mm-hmm. you know when Gormla especially is making decisions you know she's yeah. making them um, and probably the kings would have made the same decision as her yeah you know so um, but yeah so I, I do I want you to kind of like both sides potentially not like both sides because as the story continues um, that will ramp up mm. So I know uh, you have some concern over uh, events getting too dark and, and, and family reading it and, and, and being shocked by uh, what, what you've decided to write. Honestly, I, I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was that uh, terribly violent or dark or anything. Um, I would say it's maybe kind of on the level like a, a John Gwynn type book where there's a lot of, there's a lot of violence at times. Um, there's not always, there's um, fairly realistic characters. So I, I personally don't think you need to worry uh, terribly over, over much about that. But uh, I mean, I, I would guess uh, there should probably be just kind of like a general content warning to people reading the book, like maybe not your young teenagers, but other than that, uh, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think your grandmother will be too <laughs> horribly shocked. <laughs> well, no, that, that's okay. I think, um, whenever I tell people it's um, Irish mythology based, um, some people do jump straight to Darby O'Gill and the little people. And then they say to me, yeah. oh, my son or my daughter would love that. And then I'm like, how old is your son or daughter? And <laughs> yeah. eight or nine. And I'm like, no. no yeah. <laughs> it is an adult mm. fantasy book, um, you know, so yes. Yeah. Not children. 
yeah i would i would agree i think late late teens would probably uh, get the most out of it like from then on you know um but yeah i think we've kind of at least i can speak for myself have been a little like desensitized <laughs> to some violence in the fantasy books but um i think that like i heard this phrase on reddit the other day of like post grimdark where it's like there's still like dark things that are happening but it's not there's not so much like dark things happening for like shock value or anything it's like okay this thing happened but it's not like it's like something that probably will have realistically happened and we're not going to dwell on it that much and that's kind of like a similar feel so far that i've experienced with your bug it's like mm. yeah I, yeah so that's that's yeah. where i would put it i think that's probably fair i think um you know the world's quite dark at the minutes and yeah. i think um kind of when you want to read or kind of be entertained and relax Mm -hmm. You want things to feel real, but you don't necessarily want to go to very dark places. Um, that's how I feel at the minute, anyway, yeah, uh, what I'm watching or reading. Um, so, yeah, so it's not, um, you're not going to come away from this, I think, feeling, like, sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, Shauna, so this is your first book that's been published. Uh, tell us a little bit about you as an author. So uh, what's your writing process like? What's been... What's been kind of your, your journey to becoming a published author? Um, well, I wrote loads when I was younger, um, like six, seven onwards. You know, I read a lot um, and I wrote, they were my two hobbies. Um, and when I was a child, it was mostly short stories I would write. Um, and then when I was 19, 20, I wrote my first novel. Um, and I didn't really submit it very much I think I sent it off to maybe two people um but I gave it to some family to read and everybody liked it it's like a middle grade fantasy book is how I would describe it um but then kind of you know finished university and I went traveling and got married and had kids and so that was certainly a period of time where I went back to short stories um as and when I had a bit of time I didn't write often at that stage but when I turned 30, um, my husband's uncle, who had read my first book, um, said to me, you know, well, where's your next book? Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't have time to write. Um, kind of busy working, have kids, had two kids at that stage. And he was like, oh, that's not a, an excuse. You know, you're really good at it. You should, you should do it. And so that did stick with me, even though it kind of annoyed me a little bit at the time. But the next night, um, I opened my laptop and I started writing kind of quite regularly then after that. Because I sort of was like, no, I, I missed writing, you know, it's something I enjoyed. And I was yeah. like, I need to, even well, I carved out an hour every other night was sort of my routine mm. the first while anyway. And so has this always been, as has the Gale Song trilogy, has this always been what you've been working towards or there have been a bunch of projects and this is kind of what you enjoyed the most? There was a previous novel I wrote before this, and there was it was the same sort of story. There was the descendants of the two of Dan, and there was Fomorians, and it was there was one storyline that was set in the eleventh uh, century, twelfth century Ireland. But then I had another storyline that was set in the future. So, mm. um, kind of it's kind of like time, an out Outlander type vibe. No, it wasn't really like Outlander, but people think that because they think, you know, it's time travel, uh -huh. but it, yeah, it yeah. wasn't time travel. Okay. Um, but it just was too long and it didn't really work. But I did send it off to a few agents and um, one agent also, you could ask for feedback. Um, so I asked him for feedback just at that stage. I knew it wasn't really publishable, but I just wanted to know kind of really what he thought. And he said to me, look, the future stuff was okay. Lots of people are doing that. Yours wasn't the best, but the stuff in the past was really good. And mm. he was like, if you could do a book that was just set in the past, you know, I think that would really work because mm. you have all the research and all the mythology and I haven't really read any other books like that. So that is what I did. I'd already outlined the children of gods and fighting men at, before that conversation. So I suppose that really just gave me the motivation mm. to be like, right, this is the right path. This is the next book I should be working on. And it took me about a year to write it from that point. Mm. That's awesome. Yeah. And like, what made you like, so have you always kind of wanted to do the traditional publishing route? Like where 
because uh, like obviously a lot of people are doing kind of self-publishing right now um but it's a i mean big accomplishment to be you know to be published like this as well so um has that been your goal yes it would have been um just because uh, when i was when was younger and you know, avid reader there wasn't self-publishing then you know my memories um when i'm younger were of like going to the bookstore and yeah being really excited mm-hmm. to buy something new um but i did think about self-publishing for this um whenever i first sent the children of gods and fighting men out i did obviously get rejections um and some of the feedback I got was, um, you know, if you just moved out of Ireland and made it epic fantasy, um, <laughs> that would be better. Or move it to thought, Westeros. <laughs> yes, if you moved it to Westeros and changed some of the people's names, it would work. And then other people were the opposite. And they were like, if you just kept the historical characters and then got rid of the magic, then that mm-hmm. would work. And it would, you know, so I was sort of getting different feedback. And I thought, well, maybe I would self-publish. Um, there's loads of brilliant self-published books. Um, it's, as you know, it's like rapidly um, expanded mm-hmm. in the last even like five years, 10 years. Yeah. Um, but I still, even at that point, would have preferred traditional publishing purely from the fact I'm really bad at technology. I'm really bad yeah. at art design, like cover, but cover design would have been awful. And I'm really also bad at making decisions for anything to do with myself. <laughs> So I think self-publication would have been a very long process. <laughs> and I was quite glad whenever Head of Zeus, you know, uh, signs, signed me on, like they just deal with all that, mm-hmm. um, which is good because they're the experts and I, I don't know any mm. of that stuff. Well, I you have a great... you also saying that uh, there at one point there was an agent or, or someone who wanted you to put more romance into your book. Yeah, is, yeah, yeah, but you were able to... Uh, and you're able to, to stick with your guns there is there is some romance and there's some there's some hints of some future romance that i'm interested to see how it yeah. bears out yeah so it's not that i'm against romance and there is there will be romance in the trilogy but i really didn't want this to be a like a fantasy romance and and not that i don't like that genre that that genre is brilliant and does very well as it should but it just wasn't what I wanted to write. Um, and I think um, if I wanted, because I've got two female characters who are the leads, and I think if you want them to be believable as characters and you want people to root for them or dislike them, I really wanted it to be on their own merits. Mm, yeah. I didn't want people to like or dislike the couple or the relationship, you know, because you're going to be with these characters for a while um, yeah. for the trilogy. Um, and so it was quite important to me that romance was not like a key thing, not, not that there isn't any and not that there won't be some, but just initially, you no, know, I wanted the characters to stand on their own. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could definitely, uh, I, I could definitely see some people shipping some characters after, you know, at, as they're reading or at the end of the first book, I, I've got some ideas of what could happen, but <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, they do stand um, on their own very well yeah. as, as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we have we have a few questions from people from Discord, really just okay. all about your your writing process. So, one is, uh, how do you find a quiet time to write when when everyone is off to work in school? Do you stay up all night like Sanderson <laughs> or David Weber? Uh, what what works for you? Well, initially, um, it would be nighttime. So when the kids are in bed and the house is quiet um, is when I would have done most of my writing. Um, now that my, all my kids are in school, um, there are some days where I have the morning to write, but I am definitely more of a night person. I, I'm not amazing at concentrating first thing in the morning. Um, mm. So, but yeah, so it's a bit of both at the minute. It's a bit of when the kids are at school and in the evenings if I need to. Okay, let me combine these two into one question. So if you could start the whole process again, what would you do differently? And what's been the most surprising part of the whole process? I don't know if I actually combine those into, two, into <laughs> one question, but um, re- respond to both, please. <laughs> oh, uh, well, in terms of doing anything differently, I do think I would have. Um, you know, I think if 
I tried to write maybe a novel like this in my 20s, um, I don't think it would have been very good. I think you need to live a little bit and travel a little mm. bit. And, you know, yeah. I think writing this book in my 30s was better for it. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the pace that I kind of write at, you know, I can't change that. So everything has been as it only could have been, if you make, if you yeah. understand. Like, I, I don't think there's anything mm. I could have done differently. So there is nothing I would change. Um, yeah. Second question was, I can't remember. Sorry. The, the surprising, was there anything surprising in the whole process? Well, just getting signed was surprising <laughs> because um, I'd always, I sent off the, the previous book and had lots of rejection. Um, so then whenever um, I sent this book off, the first round I did, I didn't, I, I got some full manuscript requests um, and interest from small presses. Um, but kind of after COVID and um, the vaccine bounce, I sent it out again. And at that stage, I had mm. then lots of interest. And that was really weird. Um, kind of, oh, you know, people like this now. <laughs> yeah. um, so that was that was really surprising and lots of fun and, you know, really cool. One thing that you just mentioned that I thought was really cool is like kind of like you said that your life experience kind of informs your writing. One thing I really liked about the book was um, how um, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but one of the characters that is kind of in charge of a of a four to five to eight year old kind of throughout the series, and the like, like you can tell that you're a mom when you're writing that, right? Because like, <laughs> um, and I like I have a I have a four and a half year old daughter, and I could just like really see kind of like, okay, this is something that only a parent could write, like you know. Um, mm. So I I definitely see that like um kind of shine through in your in your work is that you're writing about things that you're passionate about that you have experience with so I I appreciate yeah. that oh yeah no definitely because I've got three boys as well so yeah um they definitely feed into the, the character that you're talking <laughs> about yeah yeah um so what aspects of writing do you particularly particularly enjoy and feel are, are your strong suits and then what aspects of writing are, are more challenging I'm quite weird. I like editing. I like having the story <laughs> there and uh -huh. then like trying to craft it and to, uh, I like, you know, I like to weave my stories because I've got the two POVs. I find that lots of fun mm. as, you know, how I can chapters sometimes mirror each other, even though they're two completely different characters, you know, um, sometimes Fola and Gormla are having similar uh, situations happen to them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I like that. I like kind of getting into the nitty gritty and also improving the language and making it flow. Mm. Um, you know, the blank page is a bit more scary because, you know, you can think this is exactly how the story is going to go. And then sometimes the characters will not do what I ask them to do. And then you have to think, you know, well, yeah. how, <laughs> how are we going to get to like this milestone <laughs> here if you're not doing this? Um, so sometimes that can be a bit more like not panic inducing, but um, you know, kind of can, it can take days sometimes to kind of get yourself through mm. um, little like knots. Um, so, so yeah, so that's that's kind of me when I write. Yeah, <laughs> that so it is... sounds like you're you're kind of a combination between the full discovery and the yeah. outliner, and and almost for for this series almost by necessity because you have <laughs> historical events that you know you need to get to but the characters have to I guess like you said behave uh with, with what you want them to do yeah I, I think if this wasn't historical fiction I dread to think how long my books would be you know I think the timeline <laughs> has anchored me um because it, it does it, it gives you the bones of the story and you sort of know what has to happen um so it doesn't ever take me too long to fix things um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not a strict, um, what's the two? It's Pantser and Potter, isn't, isn't that the two? Yeah, like gardeners or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm, I definitely don't like to plan too much because I think that's boring. Um, you've almost written the story. Yeah. Um, I think like discovery and um, letting the characters breathe is very important as well. Yeah, you can definitely see that in your book. Like, uh, like it's a very character focused book, and it's a, the characters feel very believable, and that's I think a hallmark of uh, like a 
good like discovery writer like so um yeah so i guess i'm praising that part um and it's it's interesting too to hear you like talk about how much you outline because it's like those two things don't often like come together but when they do they you know the results are really nice like this so oh thank you <laughs> yeah okay what are some of your biggest influences and it's it sounds like there, there was another part of this question that was, are you a fantasy reader or writer first? But it kind of sounds like the answer might be, might be both. And I know you've named off a few different books and series that you've read, but uh, what are some, what, what are some inspirations here? So in terms of reading, I would read a lot of fantasy and a lot of historical fiction. They're my two favorite genres. Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely uh, Game of Thrones, uh, The Road of the Rings, um, I really like Mark Lawrence and John Gwynn. I like their their prose and their stories. Mm -hmm. um, but like I read a lot of fantasy, you know, it's, it's one of my, it's my main hobby, apart from writing, is reading. Uh -huh. um, and then in terms of historical fiction, um, I really like Bernard Cornwell, um, Hilary Mantel and Ken Follett, the Pillars of the Earth series. Um, but I, I will read anything, you know, uh, I also would read books that, kind of I haven't heard much about I'm drawn to um kind of time periods I don't know much about mm. um and I also like I really like epic fantasy within the fantasy genre as well I like kind of things to be big scope and lots of characters as well that's Same. awesome yeah Same here. <laughs> yeah yes. I think our listeners will hopefully agree with all of those things so, yeah yes. yeah <laughs> Okay, um, any interesting books recently that you've read? Oh, um, I've been reading the Red Queen's War series by Mark Lawrence. Mm, right. So I'm nearly finished the second book in that. Um, and I read Empire of Silence recently as well. Um, I've heard of that. Who writes that one? Christopher Rocchio, I think is how mm. you... you um, say okay. last um, so that's sci-fi um, but it's very good it's very like, accessible sci-fi um, I wouldn't be very good at anything that was too science -y or <laughs> um, or hard sci-fi um, it would be mm -hmm. over my head um, but I really enjoyed those two books um, what did I read before then um, oh I read The Empress of Salt and Fortune um, which is a novella and it's brilliant um, I know sometimes a novella I'm just really in the mood for a book that size, you know, like a story yeah. that's a bit shorter. Um, and it was really good. I really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Okay. Final question. Uh, what, well, not what, uh, is your family excited to have a published author? What's been, uh, how, how are things going there? Is it, uh, I mean, uh, on release date, is there going to be a, a big party? Or are you just going to hide away for <laughs> a week or so? Well, um, there is a book launch in Belfast um, on the 1st of September in Waterstones, which I'm very happy about. That's the bookshop mm. I shop in. So, so you'll really, be there? Yeah, so I'll be there. Yeah, exciting. Okay, <laughs> nice. Um, but it's actually funny. Um, my box of books came today. Wow. Ah. Um, so like, I was opening the box and my uh -huh. husband was really excited. <laughs> and my eight-year-old came in and went, oh, bubble wrap. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and it's that's the important all, things yeah that, that was the most important thing and that just made us all laugh because yeah you know kids they haven't read my story obviously um but they are proud you know they are excited by it mm -hmm. but not as much uh, as they're excited by bubble wrap <laughs> <laughs> hard to be bubble wrap it's a, it's, i know yeah that's it. i know so um yeah no so everyone is excited my mom and dad are very excited too so um, hopefully the book launch will be lots of fun and I'll see lots of my family and friends. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, okay so yeah, yeah, so we've decided to uh, start a new tradition here. So, because um, okay. we've been getting kind of like more and more authors and guests on. And so um, we wanted to start this tradition with you. So we don't have a question, but um, we want you to ask a question of our next guest. We don't know who that is. Um, but they will have to respond to that question. Um, so, you know, sorry to put you on the spot here, but um, take a second to think about a question that you would like to ask our next guest. Okay, best book that they have ever read. 
Oh, okay. Bar none. To okay. Best book. Okay. U- usually we try to kind of make the question a little bit to like, oh, what are some books that you enjoy? And, and you know, make, make it a little bit uh, open to whatever they want to say. But, but uh, this sounds pretty serious. The number <laughs> one best number book. Number one. Yeah. yeah no no beating around the bush. Okay. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. We'll, write, we'll make sure to note that. Okay. Awesome. Well, good. thanks so I'm much, Shauna. Yeah. Really uh, yeah, no, thank you guys for um, inviting me on to, to your show, your podcast. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this has been super fun. And I guess, thank you. Like you've, uh, I think you're one of the first people that joined our Discord. So it's been super fun, um, kind of like uh, watching the process over the years. And it, we've had a lot of secondhand excitement about this. So it's super fun to read the book. And uh, I highly recommend everybody picks, picks up a copy. So. Oh, well, thanks. No, well, your Discord is brilliant. Um, I definitely have loved all the book club picks and just all the general chat, um, yeah. especially during lockdown when, you know, nobody was able to go out. <laughs> so it was lovely to have a bit of a community yeah. where you could talk about what you're up to and what you're reading and what you're watching and enjoying. Yeah, it's been it's been fun for us, too. So. OK, so September 1st, right? Um, except in America, you need to wait two months for the hardcover, but you can still get the ebook on September 1st. Yes. The Children of God and the Children of Gods and Fighting Men, Shauna Lawless. Um, if you're watching, if you're still listening at this point and you don't know all of that, not really sure what you've been <laughs> listening to, but uh, those are those are the important details, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Awesome. All right. Thanks again, Shauna. Right. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Ben. See ya. Bye-bye.